like everyone to shake hands with their neighbor. Say hello. Maybe you'll make a friend. <laughs> I'll introduce myself as well. I'm Eric Titel. I'm a professor of biology here at Tufts, where I study how fish swim. So now that we've done our introductions, I want you to try that handshake a second time. But this time, I want one of you to try to keep your arm totally limp. Try not to use any of the muscles in your arm at all. Congratulations. You've just done something that no robot can do, something engineers would give millions to be able to do. When you did the handshake the first time, it was as if your arm was made out of a very stiff material, like this plastic rod. When you did it the second time, it was as if your arm had changed stiffness entirely into a completely different material, like this rubber rod. Now, when we make things, we tend to use materials that have a single, pretty uniform stiffness. We use lots of different materials. Plastic is very stiff. Rubber is very flexible. But we can't make plastic become flexible like rubber or make rubber stiffen up like plastic. And when you think about it, most of the machines we make, we make out of the stiff material. But just recently, engineers have started making robots out of very soft materials. And this would be great, because the robots could squish into tight places, and they wouldn't accidentally kill you if their control algorithms go wrong. So here's one. This is from Robert Shepard at Cornell. Uh, <clears throat> this little robot comes up to the barrier, kind of squishes below it, makes its way along. It's a really nice bit of engineering, but the problem is I had to speed this video up five times to fit it in the time that I have. Most of these robots, they're really slow. So here's one that has the opposite problem. This is one that I worked on way back in 1999 called Pilotfish. It has these big fins. They're made out of a really stiff rubber, and they let it turn and maneuver really rapidly. Back in the day, Pilotfish was one of the most maneuverable subs out there. But it used a huge amount of energy. So if we want to make robots that can squish into tight places like that first one, but also maneuver really rapidly like the second one, we need to take some inspiration from how naturally soft animals do the same thing. And animals have this amazing material they can make themselves out of. It can be stiff and it can be flexible. It can be a rubber band and it can be a rope. It can produce energy like a motor, and it can absorb energy like a brake. It's muscle. Muscle is incredible stuff. It moves us around. We've known that for a long time. But what we're only just now starting to understand is that it also can adjust its mechanical properties. It can be stiff sometimes and flexible some other times. If we could figure out how muscle works, we could make some amazing robots. And we might just be able to explain some of the diversity of life on Earth. So to tell you how amazing muscle is, I have to tell you a story. It's a story about eels. When I was a kid, my dad and I used to like to go fishing. I guess most people probably went fishing with their dads when they were kids. But dad and I, well, we weren't very much good at it. And we were hardly ever caught anything. But there was this one time. We were fishing off a dock in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, not too far from here, and I caught something. And it was strong. I was fighting with it. I was trying to get it in. I was fighting, and it was fighting back. I had to call Dad over to help me get it in. I was really excited when I got there, because I thought I'd finally caught something big, a bluefish or a striper. But when we got it in, it was an eel. Now, actually, eels are really amazing fishes. They're basically these long tubes of muscle, and they live in streams, sometimes way up, hundreds of miles. And as adults, they migrate all the way down the stream, all the way to the ocean, and all the way out to the center of the ocean. Hundreds and hundreds of miles, and they don't feed the whole time. So basically, for that whole huge migration, they don't eat. So that 
field, and I caught that day. It probably came from a stream somewhere, maybe all the way in western Massachusetts, a couple hundred miles. It probably had hundreds of miles yet to go, and it still had the energy to fight me. Now, I think that's pretty amazing, but in fact, the story of eels is even more amazing than that, because the story of eels is the story of us. Our long-ago ancestors, our great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents 350 million years ago or so, were eels, more or less. And those eels evolved into a huge diversity of other fishes, and some of those fishes evolved into land animals, and some of those evolved into humans. Now, I first started studying eels when I was in graduate school. One of my favorite experiments was a test that some researchers in the Netherlands did. They wanted to know if this crazy long migration was possible without feeding. If the eels had enough energy stored up in their fat to make it that whole way. Basically, if they had enough gas in their gas tanks. So they got some adult eels ready to migrate. And they put them in float tanks, kind of like this one in my lab right now. It's like a treadmill for a fish, and they turn the water on, got the eels to swim, put a cover on the tank, and they went away. And they didn't come back for six months. And the eels just swam, and they swam, and they kept on swimming, they kept on swimming. They swam 3,400 miles. That's the distance from here to Paris. And they didn't eat the whole time. And when the experiment was finally done, the researchers came back, they took the eels out of the tanks, and they weighed them to see how much of their fat they had left. Were their gas tanks empty? And the answer was no. The eels were in great shape. They were super efficient. And when you think about it, they really kind of had to be, because even at the end of this huge long migration, they're still predators, and they still have to be able to escape from them. Now, engineers can make incredibly efficient motors. And they can make some really powerful motors. But as anyone who's bought a car recently knows, most motors either do one thing or the other. I used to drive a tiny Honda Fit. It had a super efficient engine, got great gas mileage, but it certainly didn't accelerate like a Ferrari. Somehow, eels managed to do both things. In fact, most animals can switch between a high efficiency mode of locomotion and a rapid acceleration motion. That's because they're made out of this amazing material, muscle. So recently, some mathematicians and I built a computer model of the swimming eel to help us understand a little bit more about how it is so efficient. It was the first model that could simulate the pressure of the fluid on the fish's body and how that causes the body to bend and at the same time simulate the forces of the muscle inside the body and how they cause the body to bend. You can see it here. That gray bar is the body. Those colors behind it are the water swirling around behind it. And those black bars you see, that's where the muscle is active. And this model let us understand one thing that makes eels so efficient. They're floppy. When you swim like an eel and you wiggle your whole body, it's easier if your body's really flexible. It takes less energy to bend your body, and so it takes less energy to swim. And that's great, but it led us to a bit of a conundrum. Because in the computer, our really flexible swimmer accelerated really badly. We'd start it up and it just kind of thrash around for a while before it got up to speed. A bit like my old Honda Fit trying to climb the hill up to Tufts. If this were a real fish, it'd be eaten in a heartbeat. We made a really stiff swimmer, and it accelerated much more rapidly, more like a Ferrari, but it used a huge amount of energy. And that's a problem if we want to understand real fish, because real fish have to do both things. Most fishes have to swim very efficiently to find food to eat, and they have to accelerate rapidly to escape the predators that want to eat them. But maybe, since they're made out of this amazing material, muscle, maybe they can have it both ways. Now remember that floppy handshake you did at the beginning? Well, when you give a nice firm handshake, you're doing the, other, the opposite. You're stiffening up your arm. And fish can do the same thing. 
So we've been studying how fish use their muscles when they accelerate. We implant tiny electrodes in their muscles, put them in a flow tank, and encourage them to accelerate. This is my collaborator, Margo, chasing a fish with tweezers. She doesn't ever catch it, but it's enough to get it to accelerate. And what we find is that the fish are turning on their muscles just a little bit early to resist the pressure of the water on them. It's the same kind of thing you do to stiffen up your arm to give a nice firm handshake. The, eel, the fish can stiffen up its body, and that lets it accelerate better. So animals have solved this trade-off between efficient motion and rapid acceleration by using muscle. If we could make something that works even half as well as muscle, we could make some amazing devices that are robots for working with people or for exploring our planet, artificial joints and limbs that work with the body's natural mechanics. Here's one. My colleague, Kisa Nishikawa, has been studying how muscle works for a long time. And just recently, she was able to make an ankle prosthetic that can automatically change its stiffness, the same way muscle does. This is one of the early trials. This man lost his leg in a hunting accident. The prosthetic he's wearing is automatically gonna get a bit stiffer to help him climb those stairs. When he got to the top of the stairs, he said he was out of breath. It was the first time, he said, since he lost his legs, that he'd been able to climb stairs fast enough to be out of breath at the top. So I think that's pretty amazing. But what really motivates me to keep on doing this sort of work is this. I want to know, why do all these fishes look different? Why do they swim differently? They all face the same trade-offs between efficient motion and rapid motion, but they've all solved it in different ways. So the next time you go to the seaside or visit the aquarium, remember the eel. Remember its crazy long migration and how it still has to be able to fight an eight-year-old kid with a fishing rod. All of these fishes, in fact, every animal on Earth, faces the same kinds of trade-offs. They all use their muscles differently, move differently, are shaped differently, and look different because they've solved this problem in a different sort of way. So we grow to understand muscle better and understand these sorts of trade-offs will be that much further in understanding the diversity of life on Earth.